Introduction to Quantum Information Processing Welcome to Lecture 8. In this lecture, we are going to see the discrete log problem. This is not a black box problem. The input to this problem is a binary string. And there is no known polynomial time classical algorithm for this problem. In fact, as with the factoring problem, cryptosystems have been devised based on the presumed hardness of this problem. Remarkably, there is a polynomial time quantum algorithm for this problem, and it's based on an extension of the methodologies used in Simon's algorithm. To define the discrete log problem, we first need to be familiar with two sets called Zp and Z star p, where p is some prime number. Zp consists of the numbers 0, 1, 2, up to p minus 1. Z star p is the same set, but with 0 omitted. It's natural to perform addition and multiplication on these sets in modulo p arithmetic. Zp is a field which, without getting into the detailed definition of this, means that it has the key algebraic properties that the real numbers and the complex numbers have. In particular, every non-zero element of Zp has a multiplicative inverse. By the way, this would not hold if the modulus p were not a prime number. For example, 3 has no inverse in modulo 6 arithmetic. Z star p is a group with respect to the operation of multiplication. By removing 0 from Zp, every element has a multiplicative inverse, which is needed in order to have a group. An element g of the group Z star p is called a generator of the group if the set of all powers of g is the group. Let's consider an example. If p is 7, then z star p consists of the numbers 1 to 6. Obviously 1 is not a generator, since all powers of 1 are just 1. What about 2? 2 is not a generator either, because if we list the powers of 2, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, and so on, we get the sequence 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, etc. So we only get the set 1, 2, and 4, which is a proper subgroup of Z star p. What about 3? 3 is a generator, since the powers of 3 are 1, 3, 2, 6, 4, 5, which is the entire set Z star p. OK, so we've defined the group Z star p and the notion of a generator of this group. An additional comment concerns the set of exponents of a generator g. These exponents run from 0 to p minus 2. Note that there are only p minus 1 different exponents, because the size of z star p is not p, but it's p minus 1. So the set of exponents is z p minus 1. Please bear in mind that it's not z p. Furthermore, if the elements of z star p are expressed as powers of some generator g, then a product like g to the x times g to the y is equal to g to the x plus y, where the x plus y is modulo p minus 1. In other words, multiplication mod p in the group is the same as addition mod p minus 1 in the exponents. Now we can define the discrete log problem. Relative to a prime modulus p and a generator g of z star p, let's first define the discrete exponential function. This function maps r to g to the power r. The domain is z p minus 1, the set of exponents, and the range is z star p. The expression g to the r is always understood to be in mod p arithmetic. So 
g to the r should be read as g to the r mod p. Next, define the discrete log function as the inverse of the discrete exponential function. The input to the discrete log is some s in z star p, and the output is the value of r such that g to the r equals s. Now we associate computational problems with each of these functions. For the discrete exp problem, discrete exponential, the input is p, an n-bit prime, g, a generator of z star p, and r, an element of z p minus 1. And the output is g to the r, again understood to be in mod p arithmetic. How hard is it to compute this function? Of course, g to the r is equal to g multiplied by itself r times. So it could obviously be computed by r multiplications, actually r minus 1 multiplications, to be more precise. But r is an n-bit number, so r can be roughly as large as 2 to the n. That's an exponential number of multiplication operations, which would have exponential cost. But there's a simple trick to do it more efficiently called the repeated squaring method. You multiply g by itself to get g squared, then you multiply g squared by itself to get g to the fourth, and then you square g to the fourth to get g to the eighth, and so on. This way, you can compute g to the exponent 2 to the n at the cost of only n multiplications. That's how the repeated squaring trick works when the exponent is a power of 2. It can be adjusted to compute any n-bit exponent with at most 2n multiplications. So 2n multiplications at cost n log n gates each leads to a classical gate cost of order n squared log n for the discrete exp function. Okay, now let's consider the discrete log problem, often abbreviated as DLP. The input is p, an n-bit prime, g, a generator of z star p, and s, an element of z star p. And the output is the r in z p minus 1 for which g to the r is s. No classical polynomial time algorithm is known for this problem, and the presumed hardness of this problem has been the basis of crypto systems, such as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Remarkably, there's a quantum algorithm for the discrete log problem that we'll see in this lecture, due to Peter Shore. The algorithm solves DLP at cost order n squared log n, which is polynomial scaling. Now I'd like to show you an interesting observation about the discrete log problem that Shore made. An instance of the problem consists of three n-bit numbers, p, a prime modulus, g, a generator, and s, an element of z star p. And we want to compute the discrete log of s. The quantum algorithms that we've seen up until now are not algorithms in the usual sense. They are in this black box model where one is given an unknown function and the goal is to extract information about the function with as few queries to the black box as possible. Usually the unknown function is promised to have a special kind of structure, such as the function arising in Simon's problem. For discrete log, there is no black box. Instead, we are in the more conventional algorithmic setting where the inputs p, g, and s are represented as three n-bit strings. What Shore realized is that, given an instance of the discrete log problem, you can create a function with a Simon-like property and then treat that as the black box for a query algorithm. Here's the function that Shore came up with. f takes two inputs, a1 and a2, 
from z p minus 1, and exponentiates g to the power a1 and s to the power minus a2, and then multiplies them together. What's interesting about this function is where the collisions are. When is f at a equal to f at b? We'll prove that f at a equals f at b if and only if a minus b is a multiple of the ordered pair r1. What's r? r is the solution to the instance of the discrete log problem. This property of f sort of resembles the Simon property. For the Simon property, f at a equals f of b if and only if a x or b is either a string of n zeros or the string r. Notice that a x or b is the same as a minus b in mod 2 arithmetic. Also, the set 0r is the set of all multiples of r in mod 2 arithmetic. You can multiply r by 0, or you can multiply r by 1. So, Shor's function seems to satisfy a generalization of Simon's property, where the modulus is changed from 2 to p minus 1, and also where the dimension is 2 instead of n. Let's take a little time to prove that Shor's function actually has this property. The proof is elementary, but we'll go through it carefully. Now, we do not know what r is, but we know that an r exists such that s is equal to g to the r. That means that we can change an expression like s to the power a2 to g to the power r a2. So now it's an exponential in base g. Looking at the expression for f of a1, a2, we can write it as g to the a1 times g to the minus r a2. Or we can collect the exponents and write it as g to the a1 minus r a2. It's nice to write f this way, because then f of a equals f of b if and only if the corresponding exponents are the same. That is, if and only if a1 minus r a2 equals b1 minus r b2. Note that we can write these expressions as dot products with the vector 1 minus r, like so. Bringing both terms to the left side, we have this. Now, this dot product being 0 is kind of like an orthogonality relation between the vector a minus b and the vector 1 minus r. Here I've schematically sketched what this vector 1 minus r can look like. Notice that the vector r1 is orthogonal to the vector 1 minus r. Their dot product is certainly 0. Now, in a two-dimensional space, you're orthogonal to a particular vector if and only if you're a multiple of the vector that's orthogonal to that particular vector. Therefore, a minus b should be a multiple of r1. This last step can be confirmed with simple algebra, v1, v2 dot 1 minus r equals 0 if and only if v1, v2 is equal to k times r1 for some k. This completes the proof. f at a equals f of b if and only if a minus b is a multiple of r1. Okay, so we've established that Shor's function satisfies something that looks like a variant of Simon's property with modulus p minus 1 instead of modulus 2. Now, what we're going to do is digress from the discrete log problem to look at this variant of Simon's problem where the modulus is larger than 2. We'll find a quantum algorithm for that problem and then we'll apply it towards the discrete log problem. Let's consider the general case where the modulus is any m greater than or equal to 2. We will define and analyze the Simon mod m problem where the m equals 2 case 
is Simon's original problem. Here, the inputs to the function are not binary strings, but rather strings of elements of Zm. Each component can range from 0 to m minus 1. The output of the function can be any fixed set that we'll just call t. So we're considering functions from Zm to the d, the cross product of Zm with itself d times, to the set t. Call such a function m to 1 if, for every value attained by the function, there are exactly m pre-images. So, for an m to 1 function, we have colliding sets of size m. We call that, in the original Simons problem, we had colliding pairs. Now, here's a property that's a mod m analog of the original Simon property. We'll say that an m to 1 function f has the Simon mod m property if there exists a special r in zm to the d such that every colliding set of f is of the form a, a plus r, a plus 2r, all the way up to a plus m minus 1r for some a. In other words, every colliding set consists of some a with all multiples of r added to it. For the original Simons problem, the colliding sets were pairs of the form a, a xor r, which is a, a plus r in mod 2 arithmetic. Notice that this property is equivalent to the property f of a equals f of b if and only if a minus b is a multiple of r. Here's a schematic diagram of all the multiples of r in the two-dimensional case. This set is a line that passes through the origin. That's one of the colliding sets of f. Now, if we take a point a that's not on that line, then another colliding set is the line offset by a. And we can take all the other offsets of the line until we have a partition of the whole domain of f. Each of the colored lines is one of the colliding sets of f. The function in Simon's original problem corresponds to the special case where m is 2 and d is n. In that case, the colored lines are the colliding pairs. And Shor's function related to the discrete log problem corresponds to the special case where m is p minus 1 and d is 2. Now for Simon's problem mod m, you're given a black box that computes an unknown function f that is promised to have the Simon mod m property. And your goal is to determine the parameter r based on queries to f. You may have noticed that the query gate is drawn here with especially thick lines. This is because the registers don't contain qubits. They contain m-dimensional states for the inputs to the query. Also, the target register, where the output is added to, has dimension whatever the size of the set t is. And regarding the addition operation, where the output of the function gets added to the target register, we assume some additive group structure on t. It could be modular addition with modulus the size of t or something else. Okay, that's the definition of the Simon mod m problem. When m is 2, it reduces to Simon's problem. Okay, so how do we solve the Simon mod m problem? Let's start by looking at the algorithm for the original Simon's problem. It's based on this quantum circuit that makes one query to f. In lecture 7, we saw that it produces an output b that is a random binary vector of length n, which is orthogonal to the string r that we are seeking. Of course, by orthogonal, I mean in the sense that the dot product between b and r is zero. 
After a few runs of this, we obtain enough Bs such that we are able to recover R by solving a system of linear equations in mod 2 arithmetic. Notice all the 1 qubit Hadamard gates in this algorithm. In fact, the Hadamard gate has really been quite a prominent part of all of the quantum algorithms that we've seen so far. For Simon mod M, the registers are not binary. A unitary operation on an M-dimensional register is an M by M matrix. It turns out that the Hadamard transform has a natural M-dimensional generalization. The Hadamard transform is a special case of the Fourier transform. In the M-dimensional case, it looks like this, where omega is a primitive mth root of 1. Let's try substituting the Fourier transform for the Hadamard transform. There are different ways to do this, but let's apply f before the query and f star after the query. For the m equals 2 case, since h star equals h, the distinction between f and f star didn't matter. We'll see that the output of this circuit is analogous to the output of the Simon circuit. The output will be a random element of zm to the d, whose dot product with r is 0. So it's a uniformly random sample from the space that's orthogonal to r. To understand how this circuit works, let's first spend a little time acquainting ourselves with the Fourier transform. A primitive mth root of unity is a complex number of the form e to the 2 pi i over m. Call this number omega. Clearly omega to the m equals 1. Here's where omega lies in the complex plane. It's a point on the unit circle. Its angle with the point 1 is 2 pi over m radians. That's the distance from 1 along the circular arc. Now, omega squared is on the unit circle with twice the angle. Omega cubed, three times the angle, and so on. Until omega to the m, which is 1 again. So the powers of omega are equally spaced points on the unit circle. If we sum all these powers, we get 0. Can you see why? Moreover, if we sum all powers of omega squared, we also get 0. Same for powers of omega cubed, all the way up to powers of omega to the m minus 1. But of course, the powers of omega to the m, that sums to m, because omega to the m is 1. I'll leave it as an exercise to prove these equations. It's not hard if you remember the formula for a geometric series which you may have first seen back in high school. Now, the Fourier transform is this matrix, where the first column is 1s, the second column is the powers of omega, the third column is powers of omega squared, and so on. Here's another exercise for you. Prove that f, defined in this manner, is unitary. And this is f star. It's essentially the same matrix, but with negative powers of omega. For all a in Zm, applying the Fourier transform Fm to the computational basis state ket a results in this state, which corresponds to column a of the above matrix Fm. This is sometimes called a Fourier basis state. And applying the inverse Fourier transform, f star m to ket a results in this state. If you have two m-dimensional registers, and you apply fm to each of them, which is fm tensor fm on the two-register system, then the form of the resulting state is this. Notice the dot product in the exponent. It's a dot product 
of the two elements of Zm cross Zm in mod M arithmetic. This generalizes to three or more registers in an obvious way. Now, let's analyze the Simon mod M algorithm. We assume a black box for a function f that satisfies the Simon mod M condition. For simplicity, we'll assume d equals 2, so the domain of f is Zm cross Zm. Here's the quantum circuit. What's the state right after the two Fourier transforms? It's a uniform superposition of all pairs of elements of Zm cross Zm. Now, what happens if we apply an f query to this state? The query maps each basis state, ket a1, a2, 0, to ket a1, a2, f of a1, a2. Therefore, when the input is in superposition, we get a superposition of states of this form. OK, next, the third register is measured. That causes the third register to collapse to some value of the function. And the first two registers collapse to a uniform superposition of the pre-images of that function value. That is, a superposition over a colliding set. Notice that this is just like for Simon's algorithm. In that case, there were two pre-images. In this case, there are m pre-images. All the points on one of the colored lines. In other words, at this point, the state is identical to the outcome of the following process. Randomly choose one of the colored lines, uniformly, and for whatever colored line was selected, take the state that is the uniform superposition of the elements on that line. That's the state that we have at this point in the computation. The next step in the circuit is to apply an inverse Fourier transform to each of the first two registers. Here's the expression for that state, which we will unravel. We take the inverse Fourier transform for each basis state in the sum. And here we apply the definition of the Fourier transform for each basis state. Notice the dot product in the exponent. Next, we can separate the phase into the product of two powers of omega. And this permits us to change the order of summation and factor out one of the phases from the inner sum. Now, let's consider what happens if a measurement is performed on this state. For some b1, b2 pairs, the probability that they occur is zero. And for some b1, b2 pairs, the probability that they occur is positive. It depends on this expression, which is a sum of powers of omega to the r dot b. Whenever r dot b is not zero modulo m, it's a sum of powers of omega to the something that we saw sum to zero. So for those b, the amplitude is zero. On the other hand, whenever r dot b is zero modulo m, it's a sum of powers of omega to the zero, which is m. So these are the outcome probabilities. The non-zero outcome probabilities can all be shown to be 1 over m by considering all the normalization factors. Please note that I omitted the normalization factors in the above calculation to help keep the expressions simple. So to work out the non-zero probability value, it's necessary to put these normalization factors back in. In conclusion, it's like this picture for the d equals 2 case. r is some non-zero vector, and there are m vectors in the space of points orthogonal to r. The result of the quantum circuit that makes one query is a random point in that orthogonal space. Let's summarize where we are with our Simon mod m algorithm. We've shown that if a function has the Simon mod m property, then the result of this circuit is a random b that's orthogonal to r. 
that is, a random sample from the space of points orthogonal to R. We actually showed it for the D equals 2 case, but our methodology carries through for larger D. As with Simon's algorithm, by making repeated runs of this, we can acquire information about R. Now that we've analyzed the Simon mod M problem, let's get back to the original problem that we're concerned with, which is the discrete log problem. Here's the discrete log problem statement again. The input is P, an n bit prime number, G, a generator of Z star P, and S, an element of Z star P. Thus, the input is three binary strings of length n. And the goal is to produce an R such that G to the R equals S. That is, R is the discrete log of S. The reason why we turned our attention to the Simon mod m problem is that there is this function that satisfies the Simon mod m property with m set to p minus 1, and the solution to that instance of Simon mod m, or I should say Simon mod p minus 1, gives the discrete log of s. So we can apply a query algorithm to solve that instance of Simon mod p minus 1. How can we use this to solve our discrete log problem? which is not in the query framework. The idea is to implement the query gate and the other parts of the query circuit using n qubits to represent the elements of z p minus 1 and z p and quantum circuits consisting of elementary 1 and 2 qubit gates for the operations. The circuit is of this form, acting on 3 n qubits, where each of the gray boxes is implemented by a quantum circuit consisting of 1 and 2 qubit gates. A property of the function that's crucial to make this work is that f can be efficiently computed. The exponentiations can be computed using the repeated squaring trick. The circuit on the left computes exactly the same operations as the one on the right. It can be implemented with order n squared log n elementary gates. That's the basic idea behind Shor's algorithm for the discrete log problem. How do we implement the F query and the Fourier transform? For the F query, we can start with the efficient classical circuit that computes F. But we have to be careful about how we use it for an F query. An F query is a unitary operation whose effect on the computational basis states is to map ket a ket b to ket a ket b xor f at a. But of course, the input to an f query does not have to be a computational basis state, and certainly it won't be in this algorithm. Back in lecture 5, we saw how quantum circuits can simulate classical circuits. That simulation used ancilla qubits and resulted in a quantum circuit that maps ket a ket 0 ket b to ket a ket some g of a ket b x or f at a, where by ket 0 I mean a string of several ket 0 qubits that are used as ancillas, and ket g consists of some intermediate results of the computation. Here's the example from lecture 5 for computing the majority of three bits. The first three qubits contain the input to the function. The last qubit is where the output is XORed. And there are four ancilla qubits, whose states at the end of the computation are shown. We can refer to this as the garbage, because we might think of disposing this information or ignoring it. Is this OK for simulating an F query? Please pause the video to think about this. No, it's not OK in general. If the F query is queried in a superposition of computational basis states, in that case, the state of the garbage register can be entangled with the other registers. So the outcome is not the same as the outcome of the F query, as if there were no ancilla register. Note that. In the slide, I've moved the garbage register to the end so that last statement of inequality is simpler to write. 
But this problem has a simple remedy. The first step is to compute f with the ancillary registers. After that, the computation is reversed so as to restore the ancillary registers back to state 0. But just before the reversal, the answer is XORed to another register using C0 gates. This is copying just for computational basis states, which is possible. The resulting quantum circuit computes the F query and restores the ancilla qubits back to their original states. Therefore, this works even if the F query is applied to a superposition of computational basis states. The garbage register will end up in a product state with the other registers. Computing the function this way only doubles the number of gates needed. Let's briefly discuss some other details about the discrete log algorithm. Recall that our quantum circuit produces a random B1, B2 pair whose dot product with R1 is 0 mod P minus 1. How do we calculate R from this? From the dot product equation, we can solve for r as r equals minus b2 over b1. But for this to work, b1 must have an inverse modulo p minus 1. It might not, even if it's not 0. b1 has an inverse modulo p minus 1 if and only if b1 and p minus 1 are relatively prime meaning that they have no factors in common except one. It can be shown that this property holds for enough b1 that one can simply repeat the process a few times until such a b1 arises. I won't go through the details of that here. It involves results about the density of numbers in z p minus 1 that are relatively prime to p minus 1. Another issue is how to compute the Fourier transform mod p minus 1. It's a matrix of dimension around 2 to the n, and we need to compute it with a polynomial number of gates. In fact, for modulus p minus 1, efficiently computing f p minus 1 is tricky. Shor's algorithm doesn't actually compute this. Rather, it uses a Fourier transform with modulus a power of 2 which is much easier to compute efficiently. And Shor sets the power of 2 to be close to p minus 1, within a factor of 2 of p minus 1. So that algorithm actually uses the wrong Fourier transform. But it's not too wrong. Shor used careful error analysis to show that if the modulus is only off by a factor of 2, then the resulting wrong output state of the circuit is not too wrong the result of the measurement at the end will still succeed with some constant probability. I won't go into the details of this error analysis here. But next lecture, I'll show you a simple, efficient way of computing the Fourier transform when the modulus is a power of 2. Such Fourier transforms also have other interesting applications beyond the discrete log problem. Okay. Let's end this lecture now.